गुड आफ्टरनून स्वाति पूनम मे बी लेट मे बी शी हेज गॉट सम एग्जाम्स आर समथिंग बट वील स्टार्ट आई विल शेयर द रिकॉर्डिंग ऑन टेलीग्राम ग्रुप एंड शेयर द मेटीरियल ऑल्सो शी कैन सी वेन एवर शी इज फ्री ओके so we have two cases to discuss today which are related to crpc very important cases they are one case is because whenever you are asked to write about any case, any answer on crpc you have to discuss about two important very important cases you should never forget these two names and contents one case is lalita kumari case and the second is dk basu case lalita kumari case is related to fir when and where and how whether if somebody is cooperating not cooperating what to do and things like that then dk basu is about arrest these are the two things that are there in the police activities in the pre court stage pre court stage of crpc that is the court procedure so we'll uh, first discuss these two things here and uh, let us see about lalita kumari case what exactly is it in the so this lalita kumari case is lalita kumari versus government of up the judgment was delivered on 12th november 2013 okay fairly recently only 10 years back now here the issues before the constitution bench of the supreme court were two main conflicting areas of concern there are two areas one whether immediate non registration of fir leads to a scope for manipulation by the police which affects the right of the victim or a complainant to have a complaint immediately investigated upon allegation being made so what here uh, the question is about the existence and the purpose for which a police establishment is maintained by the society and the country the police establishment is maintained because to prepare a specialized force which will aid the judge the judiciary the court as well as the society in immediately either preventing or apprehending criminals when they adopt any criminal act now how do the police come to know about this criminal act the police come to know about the criminal act based on the information given by either a victim themselves or a onlooker bystander or any citizen anybody who has a knowledge of a crime being committed he has the responsibility as a citizen to come to the nearest police station either personally or through telephone or to any other electronic or other means to inform the police concern that a particular criminal act is being conducted at a particular place address and who are the victims and things like that so the purpose of police is to act because you see society has to maintain itself if society has to maintain itself crime has to be contained to the minimum minimum barest minimum the possible now how do you contain crime is one you prevent it we, we allow don't allow it to happen that is also part of the police activity second is whenever any information comes about a particular activity being done take immediate action so that the negative effects of such criminal act are minimized these are the two things obviously that's what the police are supposed to do but as is the general knowledge everywhere police have their own way of uh, functioning and they have their own sops what they follow which are not exactly in concern in coincidence with the, what the court wants so a court has this case has come lalita kumari case of government of up and 2013 a judgment has given by the constitution bench where the issues has been class crystallized like this first whether immediate non registration of fir the main issue is non registration of fir leads to scope for manipulation by the police thus defeating the rights of the complainant 
so that to have his complaint immediately investigated upon allegation being made. Second, whether in cases where complaint and information does not clearly disclose the commission of a cognizable offence, but FIR is compulsorily registered, then does it infringe the rights of the accused? Because there are two people whose rights are now discussed by the court. One, rights of the complainant or the victim. Second is rights of the accused. Now, if a crime is really committed and FIR is not registered, even after information is received, investigation is not made and accused is not apprehended, then the victim's rights are compromised. Second thing is, if there is no such cognizable offence, but due to their overaction, FIR is registered and and the accused is apprehended, okay, then it infringes on the rights of the accused. So you have to balance the two rights of the victim and complainant versus the rights of the accused because both are finally part of the same society which have employed the police to protect their rights. Okay. Now let us see what exactly we will see the discussion later. We will finally see the final what is the reply given to that particular directions given by the Supreme Court. So that we will have a clarity, we will clear, we'll have clear clarity. Now, so after discussing various cases, after seeing various situations, the court, Supreme Court has decided that number one, registration of FIR is mandatory under section 154 of the code. If the information discloses commission of a cognizable offence and no preliminary inquiry is permissible in such a situation. Now here there are two things. One, it is referring to section 154 of CRPC. Section 154 deals with the registration of first in or writing down of the first information received about a cognizable offence being committed anywhere and then putting it down in their records, giving a copy to the informant and then police taking suomoto action for investigation. Okay, and in case there is a requirement of a preliminary inquiry or a requirement of preliminary inquiry is not there, that is a debatable question that will come in the next point. So then they say the registration of FIR is mandatory. And it is the experience where the earlier discussion will show, it is the experience of a very long period that police take their own decision regarding registration of FIR or otherwise, depending on them, their own parameters. So to clear the air, Supreme Court has decided in Lalta Kumari case, number one, that registration of FIR is mandatory, no option is available to the police but to register. If the information discloses commission of a cognizable offence, there is one rider given there is the if the information, the first information that is received discloses cognizable offence and no preliminary inquiry is permissible in such situation. Most of the time what the police do is they would like to conduct a preliminary inquiry to find out what is the particular situation on the ground and then only register the FIR. For that also option is not given by the Supreme Court in Lalta Kumari case saying that no preliminary inquiry rights are there with the police if the information says it is a cognizable offence. Now second part, if the information does not disclose a cognizable offence, there are two options, one is cognizable offence, other is a non-cognizable offence or a cognizable offence information not completely given. It may be cognizable but full information is not there about with the police. So in such cases where the clear cut information as to cognizable offence is not available with them, then it indicates a necessity for a preliminary inquiry. In such cases only and only in such cases, a preliminary inquiry may be conducted to ascertain what is the duty of the preliminary inquiry is only to know what, whether, number one, whether the crime is committed, number two, whether this crime so committed is a cognizable offence or a non-cognizable offence. If it is a cognizable offence, they have to so much to take down the FIR issue a report and then start investigation. If it is a non-cognizable offence, then they also they will take the information but give it to the magistrate for an order to get an order whether to investigate or not.
ठीक है दिस इज द बेसिक डिफरेंस द टू सो हियर द ऑर्डर इज वेरी क्लियर दैट आइदर ऑफ द टू केसेस रजिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ एफ आई आर इज मैंडेटरी इफ इट इज कॉग्निजेबल नो प्रिलिमिनरी इंक्वायरी इज परमिसेबल इफ इट इज अदर दैन कॉग्निजेबल दैट द क्लियर इंफॉर्मेशन इज नॉट देयर रिगार्डिंग कॉग्निजेबल अफेंस दैन प्रिलिमिनरी इंक्वायरी इज परमिटेड Now, if the inquiry discloses a commission of cognizable offence, then a fire must be registered. Where preliminary inquiry ends in closing of a complaint, the copy of the entry of such closure sub sub must be given to the first informant forthwith and not later than within one week. It must disclose reasons for closing the complaint and not proceeding further. Many times, the very first action by the police will result in closure of the case. Okay, when you first close, if the police wish to close the case okay then they have to mention the reasons why they are closing the case there is a second thing that is given there the police officer cannot avoid his duty of registering offence if the cognizable offence is disclosed action must be taken against erring officers who do not register fir many times you see we hear that whenever a poor person goes to a police station the police refuse to register the fir okay that's what the very very common complaint went to get this is the complaint that is addressed in lalita kumari case where they say that police officer who does not who refuses to register the fir should be proceeded against punishment should be given to him and what is there in crpc for uh, a case where the sho refuses to uh, register a case register an fir then the option to the complainant is there that he can approach the superintendent of police or the commissioner of police or the dgp or in finally if none of the police uh, hierarchy help him to file an fir he can even go to the magistrate and file a complaint there and ask them to give an order that the fir should be finally written so these are the three options that are available under crpc the next one let us see what lalita kumari says the scope of preliminary inquiry is not to verify the veracity or otherwise of the information received but only to ascertain whether the information reveals any cognizable offence many times what the police say is the police do is they start uh, what is called as investigation or fact finding or fault finding uh, or to check whether the information given is correct or not but what the judgment says is that the preliminary inquiry scope should be limited to knowing whether a cognizable whether offence is committed whether it is cognizable and nothing more than that all that will come whatever the other things you investigation you want to do will come only after the fir has been registered because investigation before filing of an fir has no legal sanctity even if you find out a lot of things you cannot enter them into uh, official records next as to what type and in which cases preliminary inquiry is to be conducted will depend upon the facts and circumstances the category of cases where preliminary inquiry may be made here again very clearly five different types of cases are given in lalita kumari where preliminary inquiry by police is allowed by the court what are the different types of cases where preliminary inquiry is allowed is that is preliminary inquiry means inquiry before filing of a fir before filing of a first information report okay now what are the five cases one is matrimonial family disputes second is commercial offences third is medical negligence cases fourth is corruption cases and fifth is cases where abnormal delay is there in initiating criminal prosecution abnormal delay is more than 3 months delay in reporting the matter without explaining reasons for delay okay so what are they one is family second is commercial business third is medical medical negligence hospitals and other doctors then corruption people in public places and finally delay in initiating a criminal proceeding so these are not exhaustive but these are related in all these things if you see there is one common line what is that common line what is that common line is that immediate action is not necessary immediate action is not warranted in any of these five cases immediate action by any authority immediate protection of a victim immediate protection or uh, of the social fabric is not there these are all long pending long uh, drawn out cases with which there is sufficient time available even if you do preliminary inquiry also not much is lost 
So, while in, whenever you want any other cases also the similar thing, but supposing among them what is not there, it is more important. What is not there? What is not there is harm to the body of a person, killing, homicide of a person, hurt, grievous hurt, kidnapping, abduction, theft, loss to the property, such things are not there. See, where preliminary inquiry is allowed. That means, these are all the things where there is a harm to a particular person, his property, his person or his family or his dependents. In all such cases, no preliminary inquiry is allowed. Only those cases which are of a long drawn nature, where not much of a loss is there to either the parties, if a preliminary inquiry is made, such cases only preliminary inquiry is allowed by the court. Now, while ensuring and protecting rights of the accused and the complainant, so the aim of the affair is to protect both, both the accused as well as the complainant. Preliminary inquiry should be time bound and not beyond seven days. If any there is delay is there, then it must be written in the general diary of the police station. Since the general diary or a station diary is record of all information received in the police station, that all information relating to cognizable offences, whether it results in registration of FIR or results through inquiry, must be mandatorily, meticulously reflected in the diary. And a decision to conduct preliminary inquiry must also be written in the general diary. So that they want it to be everything documented. What the court wants is to be everything to be documented. Okay. So this is the entire Lalta Kumari case regarding FIR. Now how it has affected the day-to-day -day functioning of the police nowadays? Nowadays in almost all states, there is a concept of zero FIR has been introduced. Because there are two things that come in the way of filing of an FIR is because we observe a particular crime in a particular place and we find that there is a nearby police station and we rush to that police station and ask them to note the FIR, prepare the FIR. But what they say is that we are nearby to the place where the thing has occurred, but it is not our jurisdiction. The jurisdiction is of another police station which is 5 kilometers away, please go there. So that is the general uh, reply that is given by the police. In order to overcome that, Almost all states, along with the under Lalta Kumari case uh, instructions, they have introduced what is called as a zero FIR. What is a zero FIR? Zero FIR is the authority given to the police, which does not have jurisdiction to file an FIR. The moment a cognizable offence is intimated to them, and then later on, if possible, immediate action is required. Then you take immediate action, investigation. Or if it is not there, you send this FIR, giving one copy to the complainant. The FIR is now transferred to the police station, which has proper jurisdiction. So that the complainant who comes to a police station at any particular place will go back with a copy of the FIR. He will know that where to approach. Next in the zero FIR, it will be mentioned that this particular, this uh, where it is written is not the police station. You have to go to some other particular. So, a provision is made for that. Okay. Now, second thing that what they are trying to do as a result of Lalta Kumari case is that except for the five cases given above, especially uh, no preliminary inquiry uh, powers are given to the police. And police cannot say we will do preliminary inquiry except in cases of commercial offences, medical offences, family affairs, okay, corruption cases, and then where is already there is a delay in initiating a criminal complaint. These are the five cases. So apart from these five cases, the police cannot say that we will do a preliminary inquiry, find out the veracity of your complaint and then only register an FIR. Because normally, the police try to reduce the number of FIRs that are registered in a police station. Because the moment you register a FIR, the entire legal process, process will uh, uh, start get into motion and they have that will become another case that they have to follow. Now to reduce their workload also they try to do such things. So this is what is all about Lalta Kumari case. Okay. Now next we will discuss about DK Basu case. So similar to the Lalta Kumari case on F FIR. This DK Basu case is regarding the arrest, the powers of arrest. 
by the uh, police where whether a person can be arrested where it can be arrested how he can be arrested what are the minimum things that can be taken so these are all the things uh, safeguards that are to be taken okay these are things that are discussed in the uh, dk basu case so dk basu case is equally important as lalita kumar case because dk basu case indicates what are your rights as an accused dk basu case he tries to protect the rights of the accused and it will indicate what are the rights that should be maintained and protected of the accused okay so this uh, dk basu case has a basic uh, source it has come from the lot of cases of uh, say police resorting to high handed behavior third degree methods sometimes resulting even in death of the accused people so in such cases it has become a uh, police station has become a, a center for torture of the uh, all accused people so many people have died in the uh, because most of the torture is done before the arrest okay so the supreme court judgment is crucial in dealing with custodial deaths okay then what are the procedural safeguards given by the dk basu case let us see first all officials must carry their name tag and full identification whenever they go to arrest anybody what we see what we hear in tv there some people have come who are wearing dark clothes or white clothes uh, civilian dress they'll come and then ask for this fellow and just take him by force in their police vehicle or unmarked vehicle okay so that becomes a very big issue because they never tell anybody that as to who are they are why they are taking and where they are taking the accused person okay so the people or the family members are at a loss to understand where their loved one has gone and they uh, run from pillar to post to find out exactly which police station this boy has been taken so for that the first rule there are 11 commandments in and their first rule is that all officials who go for arresting must carry a name tag and full identification particulars on their dress second they must go with an arrest memo and they should prepare an arrest memo then and there when they are arresting a person and give a copy of that arrest memo you first serve it on the person to be arrested and once you are taking him a copy should be given to the eldest male member of the family and it should contain all details regarding time and place of arrest and it should be attested by one family member if a family member or adult male member is not available then it should be attested by a respectable member of the locality now the location of the arrest must be intimated to one family member adult male member or a next friend and details have to be notified in the nearest legal aid center and arrest fee must be noted of dk basu judgment the arrest should be given and this is the requirement of dk basu judgment based on which you have got these rights you have got these responsibilities this is what our rights our responsibilities this is where we are taking you things like that in all such compliances must be recorded in the police register daily register daily okay register should be there arrest register arrest register there should compliances must be recorded and arrest team must get periodical medical examination and the first thing that any arrest team should be given is a medical examination then also periodical medical examination if the because within 24 hours any arrest team has to be produced before a magistrate that is the legal requirement so that is just before going to the magistrate or just after going to the magistrate you have to get a mandatory medical examination done these are all things to protect against torture police torture then again if the magistrate gives them one week or two weeks of police custody then this should be medically examined every week so that the, there should be a record should be maintained a record is made up where what is the physical status of the person is known to the judge now inspection on memo must be signed by the arrestee also 
and all such information must be centralized <coughs> in the <coughs> police control room. Okay. Next. And any breach of the above requirement is a, which should result in severe departmental action and it may lead to contempt of court and this will all be in addition to not substitution of any existing remedy. All the above preventive and punitive measures could go with an alternative to civil monetary damage claims from the constitutional thought. Now other orders are the precise detailed compliance report of the above orders to be submitted by the state to the state. Delayed response should be looked into by the special subcommittee of state human rights bodies. Where there is no SHRC, Chief Justice of High Court should monitor it. And existing powers of magisterial inquiry into CRPC must be completed in four months unless Sessions Court records the reason for extension. SHRC must be set up expeditiously in each part of India. Only because of the DK Basu order only, all states have now their own. In addition to the National Human Rights Commission, NHRC, every state has got now SHRC. This is, the, this is the result of this particular DK Basu case. And stern direction must be given to SHRC to fill up the vacancies also. Set up High Court, Human Rights Coast have to be set up under Section 30 of the NHRC Act. And all prisons should have a CCTV. All prisons should be provided with a CCTV to prevent police torture and police lockup deaths. And non-official visitors should do surprise checks on prisons and police stations to see how many people are there as per the books in the police station under police custody and how many people are actually there and what is their physical, mental and other condition of these people who are within the police station. Prosecution and departmental action to be mandated. Now in operationalizing the spirit of DK Basu judgment, okay, in breaking intra-departmental solidarity of errant policemen and ensuring swift, effective departmental coercive action, it is required. Now, 1985 Law Commission report has enacted 114B of the Evidence Act, raising a rebuttable presumption of culpability against the police if anyone dies in their police custody. That means 114B has been introduced into the Indian Evidence Act. Okay, and now this will indicate a rebuttable presumption that if anyone dies in custody, the defect lies with the police. It is presumed that they have attempted. So, this is about DK Basu Act. DK Basu case and Lalta Kumari case. Now, let us see Now we will discuss about the procedural aspect in case of homicide. Procedural aspect in case of homicide. Okay. Now, first point is, what is homicide? Is it a crime always? The first point that we have to remember is that homicide is in general killing of one human being by another. Now, it is not always a crime. What is a crime? Crime is what is declared as a crime under Indian Penal Code, IPC. Okay? Under IPC also, there are three kinds of homicides 
there are few which are not criminal and a few which are not criminal so there are again and in homicide or different to three categories one is justifiable killing of a person by another person second is excusable killing of a person by another person third is criminal killing of one person by another person and then punishment is limited to the criminal type then the police come into action in the third case okay so first to but in investigation the first thing that they have to do is in an investigation of a homicide case the first thing that the police have to do is exclude justifiable cases where the death is of on account of a justifiable reason second exclude the excusable cases where the law itself excuses the person who is attempting a killing of another human being and then concentrate in collection of evidence and then conviction of a person who has done a criminal act of killing one person or the other okay so this is the main issue now let us see what are the legal provisions related to uh, this homicide first 299 c ipc we have seen culpable homicide whoever causes death by doing an act number one this is actus reus with the intention of causing death that is mens rea or with the intention of causing a injury which will result in death that's also again mens rea then or with the knowledge then that is the knowledge is likely that such act will lead to a death then it commits a culpable homicide so for a culpable homicide one is act is should be there an act should be there okay second that act directly should cause death then next option is that that act when that has he has undertaken he knows while taking that act that it will particularly result in death the injury whatever he is causing will over period of time after some time will result in death and third he knows that the act though by itself is not likely to cause death but it is likely to cause death in this particular case because of a particular circumstances okay so this is 299 culpable homicide next 300 ipc murder except in cases accepted okay culpable homicide is murder that means here exceptions are given exceptions to murder are given that means homicide is there culpable homicide is there and culpable homicide amounting to murder is there but next given two or three items they remove them from the murder category and they are not murder so what are they one if it is done with the intention of causing bodily injury as the offender knows likely to cause the death of a person of whom harm is caused thirdly if it is done with the intention of causing bodily injury to any person and the bodily injury intended to be inflicted is sufficient in the ordinary course of nature to cause death or if the person committing the act knows that it is so imminently dangerous that it must in all probability cause death okay these are all the cases where culpable homicide is murder here other than the exceptions given under now 301 under 301 ipc culpable homicide by causing death of a person other than the person whose death was intended in this case if a person goes to cause the death of a and by mistake he kills b that means the intention is not to kill b but in the process of supposing he has thrown a uh, knife at a and a ducks and then this knife goes and kills b so in that case this is culpable homicide causing death of a person other than the person who is intended to be killed so this comes under section 301 If a person, by doing anything which he intends or knows likely to cause death, commits a culpable homicide by causing death of any person whose death he neither intends nor knows himself to be likely cause, he never had an intention of either killing or he knows that he will kill B. It's not there. The culpable homicide committed by the offender is a description which it would have been if he had caused the death of a person whose death he intended or knew himself likely to cause. So it will be similar to 300. but it is not exactly 300 in a 301 okay so the punishment will be slightly different now section 302 ipc punishment for murder 302 300 is actually definition of murder 299 is the definition of culpable homicide 302 is only the punishment for murder 
That means what is done under 300 as murder is punishable under 302. That's why we say 302 case. Okay, whoever commits murder as given under 300 is punishable with death or life or liable for fine. Okay, there are two things that are given, 302, life imprisonment or death. And in case death is given by the Sessions Court, it should be confirmed by the High Court. Next, 303 IPC, punishment for murder by life convict. A person is already undergoing a life imprisonment and if he, while undergoing a life imprisonment, commits a murder, then it will definitely result in death sentence because he is already under a cloud and he repeats that mistake. And he repeats that mistake, he definitely go into, there is nothing above life, there is only death is there. So, death punishment is given. Next, 304 IPC, is culpable homicide not amounting to murder? This is a very, very common category where most of the activity that happens in these homicide cases falls under 304. Here, what does it 304 say? It says, whoever commits culpable homicide not amounting to murder, that it is not murder, it is homicide, you are killing a person, yes. It is culpable, that means you will be punished, that is also yes. But it is not murder, it is not 302, you will not be punished with either death or life. Shall be punished with imprisonment for life or a term of 10 years plus fine if the act by which the death is caused is done with intention of causing death or causing an injury likely to result in death or with imprisonment of, that is the second part, that is the first part. First part is, you will be given a, a 10 years life imprisonment plus fine, okay? Because he is, uh, the act is, intention is there, mens rea is there of causing death or mens rea is there of causing an injury which is likely to lead to death. Now, second part is that with the imprisonment of a term of 10 years, plus fine or both, if the act is done with the knowledge, here the intention, clear cut intention is not there, but knowledge is there. That this particular thing, if I do it, it may likely, likely to cause death. But without intention to cause death, I don't want him to die. But I want to give him a grievous bodily injury. But still finally he dies, suppose. And that is the second part. Second part, you will get only 10 years or less than 10 years. Extend up to 10 years with fine. Okay? Here again, the intention has become very, very important. Now, the most important part of the lecture today is, this is called, we call as investigation of homicide cases and a flow chart. And this flow chart contains what exactly the police do. Because unless you understand what police does, as a forensic scientist, you don't know what is your role in the entire thing. And what are all the chart, documents, what are all the forms that are involved in this. So let us go through this uh, process flow. This is called process flow chart. Okay. Now, first step is that receiving of a complaint. First step is receiving of a complaint. And in this, the what is the process involved? Information about the offense may be written if it is given orally through the accused or a court or superior officer or a hospital. Okay. These are the areas from where you will get this information. Where do you get? You will get it from the accused or you may get it from a court or you may get from the superior officer. The person is sent by a superior officer or the hospital informs you and transfer the CD file on phone, telegram, email or letter, etc. The complaint should be brief and comprehensive. You should not give essays. You need not write essays. You write only the critical points that are required. If the complaint is made orally, then you record the statement. SHO has to record the statement. Obtain the signature of the person who is giving you the statement and initiate action. That is, in, that is investigation. If there is delay in making a complaint, mention the reasons for such delay. Supposing 10 days back rape has happened and is giving a complaint today or the uh, hospital is informing today uh, of a rape victim was raped 10 days back. Then you have to re write the reasons for such delay. So what are the templates that you will need, forms that you will need? One, minimum information in a complaint. And sample complaint you should know and sample of oral complaint reduced to writing that you should know. Next step is issue of FIR. Complaint stage ho gaya, next FIR. On receipt of a complaint, issue express FIR immediately. 
in case telephone message telegram email rumor fr to be issued after confirming genuineness of the message and after obtaining a complaint cases can also be registered so moto if none is coming forward to give a complaint you see something has happened a dead body is there you have a, a rumor has come that some red dead body is found in a nearby jungle so you go along with all others everybody is there and but nobody is willing to come and give a complaint and you have seen it so so moto you can register a case and depute men for guarding the scene of offence so here what are the format that are required fir format you need you need a covering letter to the court forwarding subsequent complaint and information because the moment fir is registered a copy is sent to the magistrate and letter to the court intimating death of the injured of any this is the thing that you have to know the next step is dispatch of fir fir along with the original complaint shall be immediately sent to the concerned judicial magistrate and copies to all superior officers under proper acknowledgement and then the forms required are express report is required and acknowledgement is also required now next step what the police have to do is send messages to others because sometimes uh, you have to apprehend the accused apprehend the uh, culprit apprehend the criminal so for that if it is a property offence somebody has uh, done a robbery or a theft in a house broken into the house and taken all the valuables and run away so you have to inform all around the people all around the bus stations railway stations so that people will go and try to apprehend the culprit so here it is uh, dealt with that messages and reports messages to be sent to the unit officer for directing clues team and dog squad that is mobile forensic team messages shall be given to the immediate superior officer and to district collector in specially grave nature of cases and case of public importance message should be given to the dg additional dg l and o intelligence crime isg and computers dig in case of unidentified or dead bodies or decoity or a rape with murder these two things remember unidentified dead body and decoity plus or rape with murder message should be given to all superintendents sdpos and cis of the state and bordering states and districts so that if the culprit is found anywhere nearby he should be caught so here you have to requisition to the clues team or the mobile forensic team and if you are anywhere a part of that mobile forensic team this is the time when you will receive a, a requisition from the police to come and help them in the crime scene then appointment of io in certain cases in several atrocities of scst cases in extremist cases where specific person a level a person of a particular level asp a dcp a dsp He is to be appointed by the DG or SP to do be the IO. Normal SHO cannot be the IO. So in that case, next step is appointment of the IO. Letter of appointment of IO will be the document. Then next step will be the going to the scene of offence. Okay, that means first step is complaint. Next is FIR. Next is informing everybody all and sundry. Then bring people around who will be able to help you. Then you go to the scene of offence. the scene of offence is to be identified you have to find out the contours and uh, put up a, a ribbon around it saying that it is police area dot com the scene of offence is to be identified and established with the help of complainant victim witnesses and village officials in case of shifting of a dead body the original scene of offence has to be established during investigation by collecting evidence the scene of offence to be recorded by way of photograph videograph observation report drawing up a sketch in the presence of mediator these are the things that i have to do when you go to a scene of offence what does the i o do first he will identify the scene of offence then he will establish the boundaries of the scene of offence then he will ask the complainant the victim witness or village official to see whether the entire scene of offence has been covered then he will put a boundary around it and protect post somebody to protect it then if dead bodies are there then you have to shift them for post mortem to the and be after before you you shift it you have to collect all the evidence that you can collect and make a photograph make a videograph and prepare an observation report notes taking then draw a sketch so here what are the documents will be sample of panchnama and a rough sketch message to the clues team dog squad and message to bomb disposal if it is required next step is providing medical aid to the injured and getting 
<coughs> dying declaration recorded. <coughs> Supposing immediately after reaching the scene of offence, the injured, if any, shall be sent for medical aid after taking preliminary inquiry. If the condition of the injured is serious, then steps should be taken to get a dying declaration in the presence of a magistrate. So here, what are the forms you will need? The format of the injury form has to be filled up by the doctor and letter to the magistrate or inquest form also it is required for recording dying declaration. Dying declaration, remember, has to be done without the presence of the police but in the presence of the magistrate. Even though the police will inform the magistrate to come and collect the dying declaration. But while dying declaration is being given, policeman should not be anywhere within the hearing or visible distance. That we must always remember. If he is there, then dying declaration is not valid. Next step is identifying the witnesses. The police I.O. has to identify and list out all the witnesses who are acquainted with the facts and circumstances of the case. This is investigation proper. Next is examination of witnesses. Now what does they do? A 161 uh, statement is taken. Statement of the witness acquainted with the facts is recorded under section 161 in part 2 of the case diary. The statements of all witnesses examined by I.O. need not be recorded, but the fact of their examination shall be written in part 1 CD. There is a case diary, there is a part 1 and part 2, two types of case diary, two parts are there. In part 1, who are the people who have been examined, it will be there. In part 2, detailed statement is given there. Now, in part 1, all the witnesses who have been examined, a list will be given. Out of them, who were able to give real detailed accounts, juicy part of it. Only their statements are recorded under section 161 CRPC under part 2 of the CD. Fact of their, okay. Useful information should be elicited by putting questions, not just listening to whatever they say, but you have to intervene and ask relevant questions and get more and more information. In this case, if you want somebody to come and give as a witness, you have to issue a notice under 160 CRPC and summon the witness. You come, this is the letter, you come here and give you the witness. Then letter to unit officers for deputing their subordinate for recording statements if required. Then sample questionnaire to witnesses should be prepared. And notice under section 91 CRPC for procuring of any documents that are required. Let's say age, how to establish an age, other card is required or the school leaving certificate is required or any property dispute is there and property documents are required. For all such things you give a notice under section 91 CRPC to the authority who is holding these documents so that he can give you the documents. Next, collection of physical, documentary and scientific evidence. Next step is collection of physical, documentary, scientific evidence. This is the place where forensic scientists are involved, especially those who are on duty in a mobile lab or uh, what do you call as a mobile lab. Okay. Now here, what do they do here exactly during examination of the scene of offense, a residence of a victim or a witness or accused you have to identify material objects, okay, which are the items which will finally result as an evidence in a court. And you have to photograph them and videograph them without disturbing their position. You have to put a L-shaped scale next to the material object and then put a number to it and then put a slip and sign with all details and then label, label it and take a photograph and take a videograph in situ. All such material objects should be listed out and incorporated in the observation report. Such articles should be seized properly. It should be packed and sealed with the help of a close team and forward the same to experts for analysis under a letter of advice. So these are the major documents that are required which are relevant to the forensic people. What are they? One, seizure report format, such proceeding under 165 CRPC, letter of advice, labeling, and letter to the magistrate and SDPO. Next, next step is inquest. <coughs> inquest is observation of the body and injuries of the dead or grievously hurt person and also gathering information about the cause of death. Okay? This is called inquest on the dead body. Inquest should be held at a place where the dead body is found in situ in whatever shape and uh, condition it is found. When circumstances do not permit for holding inquest at the spot, you have to preserve the scene by way of photo and videograph and by way of an observation report. Inquest to be held in the presence of two or more local representatives, respectable people, 
all the columns of the inquest report should be properly answered. In case of a death in custody or killing in a police station or death of a woman within seven years of her marriage and in case of exhumed bodies which are already interred in the earth, inquest to be conducted by executive magistrate. It cannot be done by the police officer. Remember. Now under this, the documents that are required will be notice under 175 CRPC to persons to act as panchas for inquest. Please come and act as a pancha. Then, uh, then uh, inquest report format, requisition to the medical officer for post-mortem examination, a letter to superior officer for sparing the services of IO to conduct inquest, letter to superior officer for deployment of additional forces to protect the crime scene. Next, post-mortem examination. Then now the scene shifts to the medical doctor and his post-mortem examination. The body is sent for post-mortem examination to know what do you want to know from the post-mortem examination? You want to know the cause of death, you want to know the time of death, you want to know the nature of injuries and the weapons used to cause those injuries. The medical officer is requested to be specific examination, specific recording of specific recommendations there. In case the death of a woman is within seven years of her marriage or it is relating to a dowry death or death in custody or death in police action or under orders of the court, a team of doctors shall conduct the postmortem examination who should be videographed and okay, the PM postmortem examination can be conducted at the spot when circumstances do not permit to transport the body because it's already highly decomposed. So if you move it, the entire thing will go into pieces. In such case, postmortem should be done in the, and in situ and on the field itself. Re-postmortem can be conducted in orders of the court and when circumstances are warranted. What are the documents that are related at this particular stage? It is a letter to the medical officer for preserving and handling or wearing apparel and articles found on the deceased. You have to give a letter to the MO, medical officer. You please preserve, Baba, hand over all the uh, apparel, all the body clothes that are worn by her. Articles are found on the deceased. Please give it to us. They become a evidence in a court. Then letter to the medical officer for preserving fingerprint, phalanges, fingers, skull and blood, tissues, hair, specify, etc. All those items that are relevant, bodily Parts are to be preserved and to be presented to the Forensic Science Laboratory. Then again, letter to the MO for preserving any embedded material like pellets, bullets, etc. and sent to FSL Ballistics Department. Then letter to the Superintendent of the Hospital or Medical College for conducting spot postmortem examination and requisition for preserving body in a mortuary after the postmortem in case of unclaimed bodies so that if anybody comes, it can be handed over for final rights. Next step is establishing identity of the unknown deceased. Here in case of unknown identified, unidentified dead bodies, efforts should be made to get the identity established through personal belongings by showing the body to the nearby people or people who have been already reported missing, circulate photographs, pamphlets, publishing and transmitting in the media and cross-checking details with missing persons. Now, what are the documents that we will see in this case? Letter to print and electronic media to publish the details of the unknown dead body. Letter to all SHOs to compare with their list of people who are missing. Next is case of exhumation. That means already a body has been <coughs> put underground. And now we don't know whether it is a death, a natural cause or a murder. But there is suspicion of a murder. So then you exhumate in the presence of a magistrate. Whenever there is reliable information, that the body of the person is buried under questionable circumstances or there is a demand for a re-postmortem or orders of the court are obtained for a re-postmortem, the buried body is exhumed for holding inquest and conducting postmortem examination. In case of a buried body, it shall be got exhumed by the executive magistrate as per 176 clause 2 of CRPC and only the executive magistrate which shall hold the inquest on the body, not the IO. Executive magistrate is only authorized for exhuming buried bodies. Now here the documents that are required are requisition to the executive magistrate for exhuming and conducting inquest, requisition to the medical colleges for sending forensic experts for conducting on the spot PME, and requisition to medical officer to conduct PME for preserving skull, bones, hair, and etc. Next step is after this is over, then forwarding the material object to the experts for analysis and opinion. Then these are sent to the FSL. All material objects identified, seized from the scene, residence of the accused at the instance and possession 
or residence and from the body of the victim or witnesses and all other places where search and seizure is made, they are properly packed, sealed and labelled and sent to FSL through the court or SGPO for analysis and reporting. So here the templates that you should have, you should understand the document that you should understand are sample letter of advice, label formats, authorization letter by SDPO, letter of requisition to SDPO for forwarding material object to the FSL, sample questionnaire on various material objects. So remember there are two things here, where skill has to be developed is that how to prepare a sample questionnaire, what questions to ask the FSL to be answered on what material objects relating to which crime. This information, this knowledge should be there with the IO. So we'll, next stage is, we'll uh, see the other things in the next class because already time is up. We'll continue the next, in the next class. Yes, Swati? Yeah, thank you. You can leave. Yes. Okay. Yesterday we uh, stopped at the transfer of case diary file. See, when a case is registered pertaining to other police jurisdictions, that is 0FIR, the CD file can be transferred to the concerned PS immediately after confirming jurisdiction through a superior. Investigation to be continued till the concerned police takes up investigation. That means it is kind of a coordinated effort, coordinated in investigation. Okay. So that is the particular provision now regarding zero FIR where you register a case where you know, in a case where you don't have jurisdiction actually because the Supreme Court has said registration of case is a must and it should be done when a cognizable offence is indicated clearly. Now the documents that are related to it is letter transferring the CD file to the SHO where jurisdiction PS is there and requisition to be filled in by the court for transferring the FIR. Next is sending grave crime report or special report. The officer holding in charge of the subdivision shall personally supervise the investigation of all grave crimes. In order to give more importance to clearing of grave crimes, grave crimes like murder, rape and things like that. So all police uh, authorities in the country have given supervisory control to the uh, say ASP or ACP or DSP, a head of sub subdivisions. And that is those who are above the station house officer or the police station in charge. They are given personal responsibility to see that uh, our grave crime supervision uh, investigation is properly supervised. After visiting the scene or investigation, the grave crime by himself or by the inspector, the SDPO should send a detailed crime report within a week to the SP. Okay, then plan of action and checklist investigation. So this is the investigation proper. There should be, for every investigation, they should have a plan of action. And you should also have a SOP or standard operating procedure or checklist for investigation. After preliminary investigation, prepare a plan of action, line of investigation for a systematic, methodical and speedy investigation of the case. And checklist for investigation steps to be prepared to avoid omissions. What do we have? We have documents that are required are plan of action and checklist for the SOP for the investigation. Then when you start investigating, there are two things that you come across. One, 161 statement given by the witnesses, then 164 statement. You say here we will take 164 statement. 161 statement is already taken. When there are reasons to believe that any important witness whose statement is vital to the prosecution may turn hostile, are won over or influenced by the accused person during a trial, such witness statement shall be got recorded by a magistrate under 164 CRPC. Yep. Yeah. So, under 164 CRPC, we will take important witness statements, eyewitness or other witness statements, requisition 
will call for the we will send a requisition to such a witness ask him to come to the police station and give uh, record his statement then establishing in the first uh, investigation one of the most important things are two things remember one is elements of the crime you have to establish number one that the crime has occurred first first and foremost uh, then second is that what you have to go to the ipc section re relevant section and see what are the elements that constitute a crime what are the different elements that constitute a crime and then you must see whether you have sufficient evidence to prove that these elements are present okay you have to collect evidence to prove those elements next you have to see is that there should be actus reus that is an action resulting in that particular crime and there is a mens rea that is motive okay there are two things under motive one is there should be an intention intention supposing it is a murder intention to kill you have to may take an action which we, with an intention to kill there is a second category of it is that with the without actual intention but with a knowledge or with an expectation there are three levels one is intention to kill and an action in continuance of that intention so that will be prove, pure uh, crime then second is taking an action which uh, you know probability will result in that particular death or whatever crime that is the second category third category is knowing that this particular thing will happen but without any particular intention you have just uh, hit with a bat you just threw a bat you are threw a bhala and you know that if anybody comes in between it you feel hits him and that fellow will die you are only practicing for olympics but you throw the javelin and it hit a person okay your intention is not your action is eventually leading to a death of a person if any person comes in between but you never had any intention to hit any person you never had any intention to kill any person but it just so happened that you have taken that action you had the knowledge that this particular javelin throw if it hits any person it will result in his death but unfortunately it hit another person instead of going and hitting in a normal place where uh, you should only see the how how far you have thrown it it hit another person and then he died so such kind of a things you have to see you have, while establishing a, a crime and investigation you have to see all these things one is elements of the crime what is the crime then what are the elements of the crime evidence to buttress each of the points of the elements of the crime then actus reus then mens rea under mens rea intention to kill or the there is a likelihood of other person uh, dying because of your action third is without any intention to kill anybody okay but action is taken and the result is there homicide has happened like that five or six items that you have to see and each of these things when you are trying to establish one thing is you have to establish that is a crime scene first you have to identify the crime scene then supposing it is a murder then you have to establish that a person has died actually a bo dead body then you have to establish what is the instrument with which it has how it has happened and what are the instrument used for killing then you have to get those instruments and if somebody has seen or somebody has heard and there are some activities that happened as a course in the course of that particular killing so all those things you have to find out people who have heard it who have seen it who have and uh, experienced it with the, their five senses and their mind and then establish establish particular thing is motive motive is much beyond much beyond intention okay so if you put everything in a particular serial order knowledge is the lowest then likelihood is the second intention is the third motive is the fourth in that particular order so establishing motive motive for the offense has to be established by examining the witnesses and collection of evidence because motive is in the mind so you have to derive from the things that are set out in the crime scene what is the motive of the person who has done it next is identifying the offenders once you establish the motive you establish the crime crime has happened then you have to identify the offenders you have to take steps to identify the offenders who actually participated in the offense by collecting proper evidence and eliminate the innocent persons so here there are two uh, pronged identifying two pronged action is there in identifying offenders one is positive 
one is negative negative is you eliminate innocent person first you see what are who are all the people who are suspects throw the net very wide and get all the persons catch hold of all the persons who are likely to be involved in the crime out of that first part is you eliminate all the innocent persons who are not likely to have taken that particular action or involved in that crime then you try to zero in on who are the possible offenders group of offenders and then offend, who are the main offender and who are the supporting offenders things like that it will it is like a funnel it's like a funnel highest number then slowly 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 come down to one person who is actually done so steps should be taken to identify the offenders who actually participated in the offense by collecting proper evidence and eliminate the innocent persons evidence can be oral evidence can be documentary evidence can be material things evidence can be you know uh, online digital there is a four types of evidence that you can collect so requisition for a test identification parade here one of the crucial things that they will do here is the test identification parade what is this test identification parade in order to eliminate persons or in order to zero in on one person who has actually done a particular act of killing let us say and if some people have seen either from a distance or nearby or in whatever manner you get those people live witnesses here and then get all the suspects round them up and in the presence of a magistrate without you yourself being present in the presence of a magistrate ask the witness to pick out that particular person from a group of people who look almost similar okay and then that is a uh, taken as a test identification parade that's taken to be authoritative identification in this particular issue of identification one problem of media i already discussed earlier media trial and media information and media focus this comes here where media if they show these all the people who are uh, arrested in their uh, tv programs and uh, day in and day out then this test identification parade will become a waste because they were the, the persons who are coming the witness who is coming may the claim the defense may claim later on that this fellow has not seen him actually committing the crime but this fellow has seen him in the tv while being arrested so like that the case may become very much diluted so you will go for a test identification parade you requisition for it call for the executive magistrate so letter to the director fpb or fingerprint bureau and uh, fingerprint inspectors to come and collect the fingerprints from the deceased accused and the suspect letter to the medical officer for collecting blood and other body fluids uh, with the accused with the permission of the court to be sent to the fsl these are the steps that are to be taken next is the efforts to arrest the accused after identifying the offenders efforts will be made to arrest offenders immediately otherwise they may tamper the evidence influence this can be fast arrest can uh, precede identification arrest can succeed identification okay so this is a very flexible uh, procedure it can come before or after next step is linking the crime to the criminal now this uh, all entire uh, the discipline of forensic science he is essentially linking the crime to the criminal and linking the criminal to the crime scene okay you have to link the crime to the criminal and also the criminal to the crime scene so these three linkages have to be established by way of your scientific expertise the linkage is one of the most common and important aspect of the physical evidence it is used to establish like how do you establish physical by way of physical evidence one is blood hair clothes fibers cosmetics and other items from the victim may be transferred this is a transfer okay there is a transfer whenever there is a transaction between two people transfer of uh, things happens transfer of things happens so that is the particular basis on which forensic uh, science continues so items found in suspect position can sometimes be a link to the victim likewise presence of the accused at the scene and their participation also will establish the link so for this documentation that is required is letter to director fingerprint bureau for taking fingerprints and other uh, and footprints palm prints things like that latent prints were there obviously uh, prints which can be seen is there those which cannot be seen uh, which can be again identified by the experts only with the different alternative lighting systems that also will be there then requisition the court for permission to take a dna profile a polygraph an arc analysis if it is required such things will be there then arrest of the offenders the accused shall be arrested immediately after collecting prima facie evidence form special parties and call about the offenders 
again this is again uh, repetition arrest card format and intimation to parents and relatives always remember whenever any person is arrested okay under 50 crpc you have to inform the eldest adult member adult male member of that particular family or any other person who next friend of the person whom he is a, who is the friend indicated uh, indicated by the accused person then you go to the magistrate because once you arrest a person you have to present him before the magistrate within 24 hours excluding the travel time excluding the travel time so you uh, get hold of the person and then go to the magistrate and ask for a police custody magistrate has got the power to give police custody for two weeks he may not give entire two weeks at one time, one go you have to establish before the court that you need to interrogate the accused to get all the material evidence you also have to establish that if you don't uh, uh, get control or uh, custody of the uh, police custody of the accused then your uh, investigation will not go forward go ahead and uh, you also you also have to establish that uh, this person if he is left out without uh, put behind bars he may try to you know Uh, tamper with the evidence these are three things you have to establish while going to the magistrate now based on what you are uh, what the pp and what you submit to the court they may give you a police custody the maximum police custody allowed is only 2 weeks or 15 days then rest uh, up to 60 days or 90 days depending on the time that is available to collect the evidence he can be kept under judicial custody but uh, it is to be remembered that uh, even though the spirit is there up to 90 days okay the person who is uh, accused has the right under constitution to approach the court for a bail and he may be given bail depending upon the stage at which up to which your investigation has come okay then in the, as a part of the investigation you have to interrogate and record confession of the accused this is a particular uh, very tricky thing you have to go by the dk basu uh, and then nandini satpati cases instructions regarding dk basu case and nandini satpati case and dk basu case uh, instructions regarding how to arrest and uh, how to interrogate and uh, hold him under custody then uh, nandini satpati case it gives a uh, freedom to the accused to keep quiet or uh, not to answer questions which are self incriminating that's the one thing that you have to remember uh, no here though it is said that confession of the accused confessions and admissions okay or frowned upon by the court especially when it is given to the police and they have no value if it is given to the police and only when it is given independently to a magistrate it has some value or to a third party or like a doctor or somebody without the presence of the police then it has some value but if it is given to the police then it has absolutely no value zero even then police will always try to get uh, interrogate and then record the confession of the accused even knowing fully well that it has no value in a court but it will only be useful for either contradicting the person when he comes to the court when he gives a another uh, uh, deposition before the court the accused shall be interrogated in the presence of mediators and when there are more number of accused statement to be recorded individually and separately the recovery of property weapons at the instance and possession of the accused this is a very crucial step in establishing even though admissions and confessions are not allowed admissions and confessions as per crpc have no legal value when it is made to the police but any admission any admission which leads to recovery of a property which is relevant to the case like a weapon and with which a killing has been made or the property which has been stolen which has been sold or uh, you know given to somebody else or any other thing that is in the possession clothes say blood stains or cement stains or items of that kind if they are recovered at the instance of the person after he has given after he has given his admission then that kind of an admission is becomes relevant in the indian evidence act and it can be accepted in the court because any admission that is leading to discovery of property or discovery of material evidence will be a standard of proof Uh, it is acceptable under 165 crpc so recovery of property or weapons used in the commission of the offence is a vital part in proving offence against the accused and recovery of property shall be made under cover of panchnama before mediators you have to remember 
every recovery, every search, every search and seizure, according to search and seizure pro forma, okay, form 60, property deposit in the form, seizure report form, these things are to be made before the presence of the local uh, witnesses, they are called panchas and that whatever you write, the search seizure uh, memo that you call is called a panchnama, okay. So, recovery of property shall be made under cover of panchnama before mediators and separate panchnama should be conducted at different places for the recovery from an instance of each of the accused. Next comes the verifying the version of the accused. Just because somebody has said something, you cannot blindly go by it. You have to get it verified and then establish it on the ground with the sequence of events uh, which you can gather by your own personal observation and noting. So, the version of the accused should be verified carefully and thoroughly. In case where the accused claims alibi, his version should be verified thoroughly by visiting the places and examining the witnesses and related records. So, one of the biggest uh, uh, weapons available with an accused is the alibi. So, if he says, at this particular point of time when a crime has been committed, I was in another state or another city, I was in a hotel, I was meeting somebody else, I was in a meeting or something like that, then you will have to personally go, go there and find out whether he has really stayed there and find out the uh, details about it and then uh, satisfy yourself whether of his either veracity or otherwise. Next, you can use polygraph and lie detector test or narcoanalysis test. These are the scientific tests that are available for getting into the man's brain, his memory and finding out what all things that he is trying to hide from us. In high profile cases, these things are done. Some accused the suspects will not cooperate and deliberately avoid telling the truth. Even though we know that he has committed the offence, then IO can subject him to lie detector test or narcoanalysis test. Offender should be subjected to narcoanalysis only with the permission of the court. Now, letter to FSL for requesting polygraph or lie detector with the permission of the court, that should be there. Then DNA test, especially in all cases of murder, all cases of rape, wherever any bodily offences are there, there is exchange of a body material, okay? And the body material can be semen by F, you know, it can be blood, it can be any of the things, hair. So, in all such things, okay, DNA test is conducted and DNA will establish is your presence and your link to the deceased or to the crime scene, okay? So, that is the thing that is used and it is a, DNA test is supposed to be as good as a fingerprint test, so as uh, final, uh, its uh, report is finally, uh, as a finality accepted by the courts. In order to link the offender to the crime in case of a homicide with a rape or a homicide of a pregnant woman, in suspected adultery cases, DNA test will help in solving the mystery. Okay, there are two things, one is paternity, the other is legality. That you have to remember, paternity is separate from legality, though in the under legality, paternity is subsumed. Okay. DNA will establish paternity, but it will not uh, indicate anything about the uh, legality. But under uh, Indian laws, if uh, a child is born to a husband and wife who are living as a husband and wife or within, say, the gestation period of 240 days after the dissolution of a marriage, that child is supposed to be the, is uh, sired by the father and of the mother. So, you know evidence contrary to that can be allowed by the court. Okay, this is called uh, assumption or presumption of legality of children because the court, the court and the law does not want any child to be declared as a bastard. So, DNA test is important in case of uh, sexual offences, rape, homicide, okay, and in case of uh, disputed paternity, disputed legality of the paternity. The DNA test will help in solving the mystery. Superior officers should authorize for conducting it. Meanwhile, DNA fingerprint, uh, it should nowadays be taken only after permission from the court. Okay, in the letter for taking blood samples, it has to, sometimes has to be taken from the court. Remand of the accused. Finally, arrested person should be produced before magistrate within 24 hours with a detailed remand case diary, explaining the circumstances leading to the incident and linking the crime to the criminal, evidence collected, details of recovery and motive for the offence. So, what are the things that you have to present before the remand report under section 167 CRPC? Remand report is presented to the uh, magistrate. Okay, requisition for remand extension also is presented to the magistrate through the PP. Now, what are the things that should be there with him? All the things, a fire should be there. Then, 
the case diary should be there detailed case diary then all the search and seizures that should be there and what are the items circumstances leading the, the criminal to the crime scene criminal to the dead body they have to be given given then evidence whatever evidence collected by way of uh, witness eyewitness accounts or uh, statements or confessions or admissions plus uh, what are documents that are taken any post postmortem report any fsl report or any of the things that are there then details of recovery if any and the motive for the offense okay these are things that should be attached and asked for a remand separate requisition has to be filed for extension of a remand period previous involvement of the accused if he is a repeat offender then previous involvement has to be mentioned because if he is a previous involvement is there and if he earlier has jumped bail or remand then in that case bail will become difficult for the person to be given now next is police custody when the investigation is not completed within 60 days or 90 days remember investigation has to be completed within 90 days in case it is for death or life imprisonment or 10 years but uh, it should be completed within 60 days in all other cases so depending on the gravity of the offense and how many days are given for completing the investigation and giving the police report the police custody is given police custody at the maximum is given for 15 days especially police custody for 15 days is given so that to prevent the person from uh, uh, destroying the evidence destroying the evidence or the uh, messing with the crime scene so for those these two things only police custody is given but of course the police will use this uh, police custody time for applying third degree and getting confession from the accused so when the investigation is not completed when the presence of an accused is required for recovery of property and weapons and to complete the investigation the accused can be taken into police custody for filing requisition before the magistrate requisition should be filed immediately after remand and surrender of the accused normally within 14 days the requisition for police custody is sent then come bail opposition next step will be bail you see you have three types of bail one is anticipatory bail when you are suspecting that you will be arrested it is anticipatory bail you have to go to high court and get anticipatory bail indicating the situation in which you suspect that you will be arrested you are likely to be arrested and the grounds for it and your own grounds for expecting to get stay out of it next is bail in bailable offenses and next is bail in non bailable offenses bail in bail in bailable offenses is given by the police at the police station level itself by taking surety or money or whatever guarantees okay then uh, in bail in case of a non bailable offenses it is to be given by the magistrate only and that to initially he will give uh, he may um, uh, be willing to give a bail he may not be willing to give a bail but uh, he has to balance it he has to balance the bail application based on two things one most major thing is that the constitution of india has given power to every citizen to stay free okay second thing is every person who is accused is suspect he is expected to be considered as not guilty till proved guilty innocent till proven guilty so if you put these two things together then it naturally means that as far as possible the distinction for the, the differentiation that has to be made by the magistrate is whether i am taking away his fundamental right okay uh, of uh, staying uh, free by putting him under uh, custody or not uh, giving him bail or not so here it is the duty of the police and the public prosecutor to oppose the bail and it is the duty of the defense fellow to plead for the bail it is under section 437 to 439 of crpc so here when the public prosecutor and the police will oppose the bail and then the io should personally attend the court on all hearings of the bail petition and oppose the bail briefing of the pp and nowadays uh, another provision has also come where bail can also be opposed by the victim because even in uh, criminal uh, uh, jurisprudence there is actually no rule role for a victim <coughs> but uh, of late uh, supreme court uh, by way by way of its judgment has given and then addition amendments to the crpc and the indian evidence act have added the role of a victim in criminal proceedings and then wherever uh, the victim feels that uh, either the police is not doing its duty properly or investigation is not being done properly or the court is being misled then they can even though the pp keeps quiet they can through their counsel oppose the bail application that's also there so then test identification period we have already seen 
Castile interrogation should be conducted where the accused are unknown and the witness or witnesses says that he can identify the accused property or the property stolen or recovered. This Castile interrogation is done in two things. One, remember, one is for identifying the person, second is to identify the property. Supposing it is a theft case, your uh, jewellery has been stolen. So, you will be called upon when it is uh, recovered from any, say, let us say, a jeweller shop, it is brought down and you are also called and among similar things it is kept and you are asked to pick out your jewellery pieces. And if persons are there, then similar persons are made to stand and you are supposed to go and identify the person who has done the crime. So, witness and witnesses says that he can identify the accused that the property is stolen or recovered. A requisition should be filed before the competent court mentioning the reasons for conducting the TIP. Care should be taken that the witness should not see the accused before the test identification period. This is a very, very crucial top, uh, topic. That's why you see many times that whenever a theft or uh, a robbery or a kind of thing or a rape or a murder is taken, and the person who is suspected, who is arrested by the police is brought in with uh, while covering his face with a black uh, cover. Okay. Why, why do they do it? Because this is a requirement on the test identification parade that the witnesses should identify them from among a group of persons and they should not see him before they actually see him among, from among the group of persons for case of TIP and selection. So, the care should be taken that the witness should not see the accused before test identification parade and this is uh, actually defeated by the media focusing on all the persons who are arrested and showing their uh, uh, faces on the TV on and off. So, then comes the collection of the expert reports. All reports from the medical officer and FSL experts have to be collected before finalization of the case that is as a part of the investigation and also ensure that there are no discrepancies. If clarifications are necessary, separate questionnaire is to be sent for dating routes clarified. Then finally, analysis by the IO at the stage of finalization of the case. The IO shall review the evidence and critically analyze and list out the shortcomings and drawbacks and identify the possible solutions for the shortcomings with the assistance of the supervisor or PP. IO should ensure that the proper evidence is available to prove the ingredients of the sections of law. Here, what the crucial point is that you, you should take a section of the law with which you are charging him, find out the elements of the particular section of that crime, list out all the elements and list out all the evidences that are necessary to prove that element is present and that this person is linked to that particular element. These are the four things that you have to show and uh, unless you have that, your investigation is not complete. Then it is reviewed by the supervisory officer. Supervisory officer at the end of the serious cases, the supervisory officer will also see the evidence, PP will also see the evidence and they will suggest corrective measures to ensure that investigation is as per plan of action. Then case property management, all properties and material objects are seized shall be accounted for. Then uh, there is what is called as a chain of custody. From the moment it is taken from the scene of crime till it is presented in the court, a, a record has to be maintained. A chain of custody has to be maintained as to who is taking it, who is in custody of it, to whom it is handed over and what he is doing with it and how it has been replaced or finally how it is given to the court. This entire thing, a chain without any link in a break of link in between has to be maintained. Where and when if there is a chain of li uh, breakage and link, then the case will be thrown out of the court. So, the case property management is so very important. All properties and material objects seized shall be properly accounted for and deposited in the court immediately. Then way, Malkhana, it will be deposited there. Then legal opinion. After completion of the investigation, the IO shall personally discuss with the legal officer with the case file to know whether the evidence collected is sufficient to establish the guilt of the accused and to carry out the suggestions, if any, given by the legal officer. One letter to APP for his opinion under Form 67, APP opinion in Form Number 68. Then permission for prosecution of the accused. Wherever necessary, prior permission is to be obtained from the competent authority to prosecute the accused. In case of Arms Act, Explosive Substances Act, Preventive Corruption Act and all these things, letter to SPCP to write the her permission has to be obtained. Okay? Then comes the finalization of the undetected cases after final, making all possible efforts. If there are no clues to detect the case and apprehend the accused, the IO will submit a report, a final report. On approval to serve the notice to the complainant and submit final report to the court, enclosing acknowledged copy of the notice of the complainant. Then letter to CPSP for permission to close the case and unlocated cases and notice to the complainant and format of report under 173 CRPC. 
then comes the here uh, final report is given it means we are unable to supposing you say you go to a police station and say that uh, my phone is lost while traveling in a bus okay they will give an fir and after a few days you go there and they'll give you a final report and we have made searches and it could not be found so that's the kind of thing final report it will close the case without really doing anything so the format of the report final report is under 173 crpc then gazette publication if the identity of the deceased is not established the unit officer shall be requested to address dg cid to publish photograph in a gazette then filing of charge sheet and so earlier one was to saying that i were unable to find any evidence then the opposite to it is that you found the evidence there is a elements of the case there is an accused there is a dead person or a victim a crime has been committed and there is sufficient amount of evidence that is collected by you to establish the crime if such is the case then you file a charge sheet after completion of the investigation after 60 or 90 days as the case may be the charge sheet to be prepared in consultation and approval of the prosecuting officer and filed in the concerned court enclosing all the required documents and copies of charge sheet with all documents are to be given to all the accused also this is charge sheet under 173 crpc <coughs> <coughs> so this is the process chart which will uh, give you a complete idea as to how we have uh, this entire thing is uh, managed okay investigation how investigation happens this is the entire thing is there i am putting it in the um, uh, telegram group also so you can uh, go through it now we'll uh, decide uh, discuss one particular case today let us come only today uh, this is supreme court sets aside a death penalty in case of rape murder case of a 6 year old child okay this is the case details i'll read out you if you possible you can give me your opinion otherwise i'll uh, continue the discussion supreme court has ordered release of a man awarded a death penalty in a case related to a rape and murder of a 6 year old girl child discarding the circumstantial evidence including dna analysis due to procedural irregularities and non compliance of statutory mandates see i gave you the entire process the process is mostly a uh, procedural process and there are irregular uh, re, uh, procedures sops that are to be followed at each of those cases and all different documents that are to be mentioned and maintained in each of those cases now in case such things what i have told you are not followed what happens is given is very very clearly mentioned in this particular case the court set aside the bombay high court judgment which upheld the death penalty in view of the gaps in the chain of circumstances pointing to the guilt of the accused okay so it was a 2015 hc judgment upheld upholding the death punishment uh, then uh, the supreme court said that the high court has erred the trial court sessions court has also erred okay so now let us see what is the story the story is that a 6 year old girl a 6 year old girl was found dead near her house in a bushes in the bushes okay then uh, that girl uh, the finally it uh, was identified and they search for her she was missing and they found out that she was lying uh, in a naked position and then she was uh, subjected to rape and murder so that was the position so the police uh, went to that particular uh, scene of crime cordoned off and uh, took out the body sent it for post mortem and then tried to searching for the person who was the accused Uh, it took them some time but uh, immediately there was no obvious connection with anybody nobody has seen that girl with any other male member so that uh, they can clearly point out who is uh, the most probable person who has committed the rape and murder but after a few days uh, suddenly the police uh, io was changed and there was lot of hue and cry in the this was done in, this happened in thane nearby so there was a lot of hue and cry in the media and the papers and other things and the io was changed by the police and the new io after he came over immediately within two days he caught hold of uh, the accused he caught hold of the evidences and he had filed the case and it was uh, tried in the trial court and the dna test was also done and the dna test the his uh, blood was found on the clothes of the uh, dead body and then uh, semen was also found on the clothes of the dead body 
okay this person semen was also found and uh, the victim's blood was found on this man's clothes and dna test has established this linkage and based solely on the basis of a dna test where there were no eye witnesses where there were no eye witnesses of these two people either going or uh, doing uh, something together but then only based on the circumstantial evidence and this uh, dna test the trial court held him to be guilty and ordered him to be hanged till death then it was uh, submitted to high court for confirmation and the high court has also bombay high court has confirmed the death sentence and uh, he was uh, put behind bars he was waiting under death row for 13 years he was there under the court and he applied for a revision uh, appeal to the supreme court because he didn't have money so the government appointed their own lawyer under the legal service authority act so this lawyer in supreme court who was uh, sent to uh, appeal uh, support the appeal and plead for the appeal he succeeded finally in proving that this particular person who has been now sentenced to death has nothing to do with the uh, uh, this particular uh, rape and murder how was he capable of doing it how did he do it do you want to say anything and otherwise shall i continue i'll give you the details anyone of you want to say something punam and swati oh sir yeah okay so i'll continue with that i'll show you what it is okay so here the the tender age of 6 okay that uh, the girl uh, died okay so even though this was a very very you know heinous crime but uh, the issue here was that after making analysis of the evidence the bench said commission of the crime against the 6 year old innocent child is not in dispute they said yeah child has died number one that is proved second is the child was subjected to rape and murder two that is also proved but everything else after that it was doubtful case everything else after that who has done it how he has done it what was the linkage between the two these three or four things were always in a doubt now circumstances forming the chain of commission of this crime cannot and do not point conclusively because see in a murder case the level of proof that is required is beyond all reasonable doubt what do you mean by beyond all reasonable doubt it means that if there are two hypothesis to explain all the events on all the evidences that are there on the ground okay then it is not beyond all reasonable doubt then there should be only one hypothesis that is given by the pp that is should hold the, the water and the alternate hypothesis should not hold any water that should be the case only the only then it is called beyond all reasonable doubt okay so now here they said what is the case in this particular case how the circumstances forming the chain of commission cannot and do not point conclusively to the appellant okay there is no conclusiveness is not there it is missing okay then the sentence being put to death because it is a death sentence you have to be very very clear fir was lodged on june 12th now what are the details fir was lodged on june 12th of 2010 in the bhayandar police station of thane maharashtra the charges that the appellant killed the child living in the same chawl after sexually assaulting and threw her body in a drain the prosecution relied upon the appellant's disclosure statement recovery of blood and semen stained clothes and scientific analysis including the dna examination for that particular purpose what is the prosecution depended upon on the confession statement or a disclosure statement or admission statement it's called disclosure statement saying that no i have done it and i have kept my clothes here i have uh, you know done this particular thing i have done this particular thing these are my clothes i have kept them in secret place like that okay so here and then uh, dna uh, analysis was also done of the blood and semen on the stained clothes and based on those these two things only that means basically basing on the person his admission then recovery of clothes based on that admission and then the check of uh, blood and semen uh, identification through dna on those clothes this is the only four things on which the entire case relied upon however the first question that the supreme court asked is 
how did you suspect this man in the first instance? They asked the prosecution, what is that that led you to this particular person? You know, there are so many people in that Charles, Charles, Bombay Charles, you know, there are 200 or 300 people living in the same Charles. They said, out of these 200 persons, you have identified this one particular person. How did you arrive at this particular one, one particular person? That the police were unable to say. They said, we received information. They said, who gave you the information? The police were unable to present. The prosecution was unable to show who gave them the information. They said, we received secret information. So, so that means that there was no link, that one link was broken. The link was between you are suspecting that equal, that particular item that has happened and this person linking these two, that first link was broken. So apparent being a suspect in the first instance remains a mystery. As a person who may have shed light on the essential aspects went unexamined. That means the eyewitness or the people who have given them information, given information, supposedly given the information to the police, were not examined as witnesses by the prosecutor in the trial court. That's okay. Second thing is, then I, I was were changed two or three times during the particular thing. Then the court asked why I was were changed. In the first uh, I was, he could not uh, uh, apprehend this particular person. He could not identify this particular person as a, a culprit, nor could he identify, uh, apprehend him. But when the I.O. was changed, immediately within two days, this fellow was apprehended and then all the tests were done and he was completely put behind bars and things like that. So, how come that one I.O. has completely failed for so long and the second I.O. you change immediately within two days, everything has fallen into place, he has made an admission, he has given the clothes and then as a part of this, there was another uh, event was that the first I.O. made a search of the place where this fellow was living in the chal room. The room was 8 by 6 single room, 8 by 6 room and then the child and then the first I.O. made a search, entire thorough search of the room, nothing was recovered. But when second I.O. was appointed after 3 months or 4 months, this fellow immediately went there and he found out the clothes. Uh, he, he got a confession from the uh, person, accused person, he has apprehended the person, he has taken a confession from the person and he has discovered the clothes from the same bloody room, same room. Okay, and the second time he went there and then with uh, the blood and semen and everything very conveniently available on those clothes. So, this the court asked how was it that even the first, the person who has made a search, first in line, if he could not get anything in the room, how is it that in the second I.O. he got everything and in such a very, very short time of investigation, within hours he could get everything. So then that there was no answer given to that. So this was also taken as a big, very big lapse because the another chain and the link in the chain has been broken. Now that the basis of on what basis the appellant was suspected again? Second, the essential aspects. Now, then he said, no reason was given for the need not to comply with the requirement of 53A, examination was accused by the medical practitioner. So this uh, accused was not subjected to medical examination under 53A, okay? Even as a detailed procedure has been prescribed in the police manual, okay? Then uh, Home Affairs, MHA, guidelines and collection, storage, transportation of DNA samples, chain of custody and expedition in submitting to the laboratory were also not followed. What the police have done? What the police have not done actually? They have not followed the SOPs and guidelines for collection of DNA sample. Then the court asked the only thing, when did you collect the blood sample? Who gave the order for taking the blood sample? Who gave the, where is the consent of the person to take blood sample? And who collected the blood sample? Where it was uh, stored? When it was uh, taken? When it was sent to the FSL? When was the magistrate informed? or the superior informed, where it was mentioned in the case diary. And finally, what, where is the covering letter? When did you go to the FSL? When did they examine? Okay, what were the parts that they examined? What was the result? What is the, what is the rough notes? What is the final report? So like that, every each and step, this is called chain of custody. So this chain of custody was completely broken. There was absolutely no record submitted to the Supreme Court Regarding all these steps, step by step by step by step, who did what, when, how, that, that, that uh, 
chain of custody was broken so he was also the accused was also not subjected to the medical examination detailed procedure prescribed is also there but they have broken it the court said who took the samples was not explained and the doctor who conducted the exam of dna has not been stepped as a witness he was not brought into the witness box even though the dna evidence may be present its reliability is not infallible that they said the court also noted that there is unexplained delay in sending the samples collected for analysis there is almost a, a gap of 3 to 6 months from the date it was supposed to have taken till the date that was given to the fsl there is a gap of 3 to 6 months in between okay so there why delay there was no explanation for the delay uh, premises already searched was searched again i told you in one room it was searched by one ivo nothing was found and again after 3 months another ivo searched it and he got everything all the incriminating material from the same room which room was hardly 8 by 6 there is absolutely no way there is nothing no storage nothing is there just a particular bland room and then how could he get all these things that was the doubt the reason for which is not born from the record and lock panchnama is not prepared when they opened the room that panchnama is not prepared no samples of blood and semen of the apparent can be said to have been drawn by medical or paramedical staff who drew the samples there was no record for that no chain of custody of the samples allegedly an additional sample is taken from the apparent more than a month after the arrest one more sample was also taken after a month after the arrest allegedly disclosure statement of the apparent was never read over and explained to him here another issue very simple thing is that the disclosure statement the admission and disclosure statement was written down in marathi was written down in marathi and this particular accused was a hindi speaking person he does not understand marathi and it was never indicated therein that in the that disclosure statement that this particular uh, entries that we have written down has been explained to the party in hindi that particular line was not mentioned and he has also not mentioned that he understood it it was explained to him in hindi that he understood it so in all probability he said what you said in marathi has what you have written down in marathi has nothing to do with what the other person has said that the that is the view taken by the supreme court it was never read over and explained to the appellant in his vernacular language that is hindi it was written in marathi but that man was only hindi speaking person and it was never explained to him in hindi the appellant was not residing alone at the place alleged to be his residence that one particular room three or four other people were also living along with him he was only one of the members sitting in that room and then if uh, so many people are living in that room then all of them should be the uh, suspect under the suspect category and they were not subjected to that suspect treatment so then the court asked then if in this room four male members are there one uh, dryer and one bunny are found okay and if these things uh, can be belong to can be used by any of the four as it happens when you are living in four or five people in one room many times you interchange uh, the clothes so the court said how is it uh, completely clear that only this person this uh, dryer and this bunny belongs to only this person not to the other three and the other three were never examined and the other three were never put to the test the thorough grind of the law so they were let off that so 13 years back this was after 13 years here a child of a tender age was assaulted and brutally killed okay appellant was arrested on suspicion of having committed the crime police proceeded in accordance with it and were supposed to have made discoveries as per statement made by the appellant in custody then in what manner can it be said that at the time when such a positive call was required to be made by authorities reasonable grounds did not exist for the compliance of section 53a to be a must in view of the court is a glaring lapse in the investigation of this crime for the 6 year old child was sexually assaulted on both the private parts of her body medical examination of the appellant would have resulted into ascertainment of such assault because whenever there is a sexual uh, case sexual assault rape and uh, assault such cases there first thing that is most important is the medical examination medical examination not only of the victim but also of the accused both have to be done and then detailed report has to be collected and report has to be made part of the investigation report only based on that sample should be taken all the bodily fluids sample should be taken control should be taken and suspected uh, things should be taken his clothes should be taken whatever he was wearing at that particular point of time and they should be examined and all these things are the chain of custody are very very important in order to establish 
that a particular crime has been committed by him. These are of this chain of custody is what has been missed by the police. So the Supreme Court has even gone to the extent of asking for action against the police for framing this innocent person and also said that maybe the person who has actually done the crime is now roaming free because of the incompetence of the police. So and this person is let off saying that he has not committed. There is no proof on record to show that this particular person is any way linked to the crime that he is supposed to have committed. That is the con conclusion that is drawn by the uh, Supreme Court. So this is how uh, this particular case has brought out the importance of chain of custody, the importance of circumstantial evidence, the importance of blood, the semen uh, collection and then uh, medical examination just after apprehension, medical examination, medical report uh, of the victim as well as the accused. These are the five or six things which are related to our subject has been clearly brought out. The importance has been brought out. Police think that they can do anything and then get away with it. But finally, after 13 years, that man has been set free. Mainly because the police failed to appreciate, failed to follow the strictly the SOP that is given in the earlier what we have studied so far. That's particular table, uh, the process chart. Okay, so today let us stop. Thank you.